So I'm going to tell you about what's so hot about the carbonates in Lake Kivu. And carbonates, uh, when we uh, analyze lake sediment cores from the East African Rift Valley, we typically find that the presence or absence of carbonates in the sediments uh, indicates relatively dry conditions if carbonates are there and relatively wet conditions if the, if the carbonates are not there. And basically it's because these lakes are typically very dilute in their, in their um, uh, salinity and uh, if the lake level drops because of climate change to a uh, closed basin situation, then the salinity of the lake water goes up and carbonates accumulate. And here's a very nice example of that uh, for Lake Turkana in northern Kenya, a uh, study that uh, a very nice paper put out by Morrissey and Schultz in uh, 2014. And it shows, uh, highlighted here, the uh, carbonate record uh, showing that carbonates were present up until about 12,000 years ago. Then they uh, disappear from the sediment record until about 4,000 years ago, and then they reappear again. And the interpretation of this, which is a very robust interpretation, is that Lake Turkana was a closed basin prior to 12,000 years ago. During the African human period, uh, the lake level rose close to 100 meters to the point where the lake was overflowing into the uh, Nile. And uh, under those circumstances, lake water was far uh, less saline. It was very dilute. And so the waters were undersaturated with respect to carbonate. Um, I recognized as I was putting this talk together that this important paper of a quarter of a century ago uh, from Lake Malawi shows uh, with much lower resolution, but it shows uh, analyses in a number of cores uh, showing uh, carbonate abundances occurred between 7,000 and 10,000 years ago in uh, a number of these cores, indicating that Lake Malawi was at a low stand during the African humid period. So the African humid period really applies to North Africa, well, north of uh, Lake Rukwa, so from about eight degrees south latitude to the north, um, uh, the climate in the eastern portion of Africa, anyway, was responding to northern hemisphere insulation. Malawi, in the southern hemisphere, at about 12 degrees south, was responding to southern hemisphere insulation. I'm going to talk today about uh, cores recovered from Lake Kivu. Uh, my co-author, uh, Bob Heckey, recovered these cores in 2012, and I forgot to mention the other uh, co-author on the paper, uh, Jillian Votava, was my master's student. She's the one who really did the work on these cores. I get to come to Zaragoza and talk about them. Uh, at any rate, I'll be talking, oh, sorry. I'll be talking about two cores, a piston core taken from about uh, close to 400 meter water depth, 350 meters water depth in the uh, deep basin, and then a core from about 80 meters water depth uh, as well, a short core. Um, in the uh, deep water piston core, we have a core that's about eight meters in length, and uh, we have reasonably well-behaved radiocarbon dates from 3,600, and these are on plant macrofossils, from 3,600 down to 9,000. Then we have a problematic date. But all of these line up nicely in a line, and we can tie them stratigraphically in with a um, younger date of about 2,500 years from core 15A uh, that gives us uh, another date up in this region. And consequently, we have well-behaved uh, radiocarbon dates, with the exception of that one, indicating the base of the core, which bottoms out in a gravel, indicating a, a low stand of the lake at uh, 12, 000, about 12,300 years ago. In this uh, core, we find carbonates are not present until about 3.1 thousand years ago. And these are aragonite uh, uh, carbonates uh, in this interval here from 3.1 to 2.2 thousand years ago, another interval from 1.9 to 1.5 thousand years ago. The upper about 11, uh, uh, sorry, 1.1 meters or so uh, was highly disturbed from methane uh, escaping from the sediment core as we brought it up from uh, the deep basin. The shallow core, um, taken from about 80 meters water depth, uh, also shows um, uh, presence and absence and presence of aragonite uh, in, in the sediments. Uh, we have a good, uh, robust lead 210 chronology on this core down to you know about 100 years ago. Uh, but 
uh, what we see from that is that if we extrapolate the sedimentation rates from the lead 210 analyses down core, we estimate that this uh, carbonate accumulation started around AD 1580 um, and ended around 1905 and then began around 1970 on up to the present. All right, so we have these uh, carbonate events. And uh, looking at the previous core, we'd think, oh, okay, it's the end of the African humid period. Around 3,000 years ago, uh, Lake Kivu became relatively dry and the carbonates were accumulating. But Kivu is not a closed basin lake today. Uh, carbonates are accumulating in the sediments. In fact, um, compared to lakes Malawi and Tanganyika, where about 85% of the water is lost by evaporation and only 15% uh, flows out the outlet. In the case of Kivu, roughly 50% of the incoming water is flowing out the Ruzisi River to Lake Tanganyika. The other 50% of the water is still uh, in the lake. So what's going on here? Why, why carbonates in this open basin lake? Well, Kivu, as many of you realize, is a most unusual lake. Uh, if you look at a temperature profile in Lake Kivu, relatively warm waters at the surface, cooler waters at mid-depths, and then the warmest temperatures in the water column are at the bottom of the lake in uh, below 300 meters water depth. And this is because uh, uh, the salinity of the deep waters is relatively high, and this is because of hydrothermal, geothermal input of waters uh, into the uh, deep lake basin. The deep waters also contain very high concentrations of methane and CO2, making this, I suspect, the most dangerous lake on the planet today. There are about two million people that live in the drainage basin. If any activity results in this deep water column overturning, there will be so much methane and CO2 released that there will be a massive um, um, mortality as a result of that. We looked at the uh, calcium budget of the lake to try to figure out why we're having carbonates in, in, in this lake. And basically, we, uh, from the literature, we got information on calcium concentrations in the inflowing streams in the outflowing Rusisi River and some analyses of hydrothermal springs. And you can see that calcium concentrations are much higher in the hydrothermal springs. Uh, the Swiss uh, have, from Eavog and Eteha, have done beautiful work working out the um, relative importance of hydrothermal input into the lake compared to surface water input. And if you multiply the numbers here, you find that um, hydrothermal input of calcium to this lake is uh, an order of magnitude higher than that of inflowing rivers. In fact, the Ruzizi River is draining more calcium out of the lake than all the surface rivers are carrying into the lake. So this tells us that the calcium story in Lake Kivu is a story of hydrothermal input and not a story of, of climate. Sorry to be talking about that at a pages meeting, but that's the way it is. <laughs> um, we've actually looked at the budget and, uh, well, okay, so we have a net accumulation of 10.5 times 10 to the seventh um, kilograms of calcium per year. That works out to this kind of a flux. And the fluxes that we have measured in our two sediment cores are of that order of magnitude. The shallow water core is right around 40 grams of calcium per square meter per year. The deep water core is about half that amount. Uh, but uh, at any rate, it's in the right magnitude. So everything's adding up. If you look at the isotopic composition of the aragonite, it's all uh, very heavy compared to these various measurements that Mike Talbot published on years ago from various closed basin lakes around the world. And we've done the calculations and we find that the, um, the oxygen isotope composition of the aragonite in the surface of this shallower water core is uh, basically in equilibrium with the uh, delta O18 of the DIC uh, in the lake. Uh, the carbon isotopic composition is a little bit heavier uh, by about one per mil. Uh, but it's, it's very close. So we have a very compelling argument to uh, think in terms of this being a, a signal of hydrothermal activity and not one of, of um, uh, climate. So uh, according to our, uh, from this then, we would say significant hydrothermal activity in Lake Kivu did not begin 
until around 3.1 thousand years ago, went on till 2.2, shut off for a while, came on at 1.9 uh, until 1.5, shut off again for a while, came back on around AD 1580, shut off at 1905, came back on around 1970. Now, um, it, it's hard, you know, volcanic activity has been going on in this, in this region for the last 100,000 years. And it'd be nice to get some longer cores to see if we see evidence of the hydrothermal activity. I suspect we would if we went further back in time. And uh, I see that the Shepherd's Crook is uh, coming out and is about to uh, pull me off the stage, so I will just rapidly put these conclusions up and say, you know, this sporadic activity of hydrothermal activity in the lake, coupled with the fact of the serious ramifications of a methane and CO2 release from this lake basin, uh, uh, makes this a very dicey situation indeed. Um, and uh, there are presently methanes being extracted from the deep waters. It's going into uh, generation of electricity in the region. And uh, that's, that's a good thing. That will help. Thank you. Okay, first of all, let me thank the conveners for giving me the chance to present here the latest results of our Chaubahir core. I never pronounced it correct, uh, sorry, Asfa, but uh, I try my best. So this is part of the HSPDP uh, drilling project in uh, East Africa. And the work was only possible because of a very good teamwork. Here you see listed the names of the complete Chauba here team, but we also got support of the HSPDP team guided by Andrew Cohn as the main PI. And of course, I have to mention all the funding agencies, but last but not least, I would like to thank the Hammer tribe uh, in person, uh, Chief Wino, who uh, not only allowed us to do the drilling on their territory, but also became very nice helpers and at least let's say friends, during our six weeks of stay in southern Ethiopia. Okay, let me first give you some general settings of the complete HSPDP uh, aims before going into details to our uh, site. As I mentioned, uh, Chaubaher is um, part of the hominid site and Paleo Lake drilling project aiming in uh, to, to sample more paleoenvironmental data close to key paleoanthropological uh, locations in East Africa in order to get more high resolution information of and regional information of the climate and environmental development. Uh, this is done in order to test some hypothesis connecting climate with human evolution. And I'm not going into the details of these hypotheses. You should know them. Uh, but we, <laughs> we try, <laughs> I guess at least, <laughs> we try to, uh, to answer the question if our long records uh, could help us to understand and to, to prove some of these ideas behind these hypotheses. And uh, is it possible to decipher in our long records uh, conditions changing from a more sta uh, sorry, changing from a more stable habitat to a progressive habitat? Or is it possible to deliver uh, highly variable climate conditions over a certain time frame, which was responsible for driving human evolution? So uh, here you see the sites chosen for, the, um, for this project. We cover from very old parts of uh, human evolution here in the northern Avash, the story of Lucy. We covered the time frame from Homo habilis uh, to Homo erectus and Last but not least, Chauber here, together with Lake Magadi, is covering more or less the story of uh, our direct ancestors, Homo sapiens sapiens, the anatomically modern humans. Okay, so um, we did the drilling in southern Ethiopia, and first of all, I would like to introduce you to the site. So uh, Chaubaher is lying here in the southern part, uh, close to Lake Tokarna. And um, depending on the, on the climate during the year, we have a, a rainy season, more or less during the summer months, and a more pronounced dry climate during the northern winter. And another important thing is uh, our site is only 90 kilometers away from the famous Omo Kibish findings of the, at the moment, oldest 
uh, hominin, uh, modern hominin fossils, sorry to say that, <laughs> uh, in East Africa. I know this is a long discussion between East and uh, South African colleagues, but we take it easy. Um, <laughs> So what we did um, in, in, in a sort of pre-study, we did it, uh, we caught a transect from the west to the east with a short course covering at least the last 20 to 40,000 years. And then in 2014, we drilled this uh, uh, Playa Lake one, uh, twice, first in March, um, reaching down here from the center to 40 meters, but because of very rough uh, climate conditions at that moment, or weather conditions at that moment. We uh, faced a very early uh, rainy season, and then it was really dangerous not to lose the coring system. It was covered by water up to the knee for two or three days. I was really a bit nervous about that. Uh, I had to pay afterwards, but nothing happened. We rescued it. Then we decided to do the real deep drilling later a bit more or closer to the to this western uh, side, and uh, I have to mention that today it is a playa lake, and as far as we know, it's um, in that tectonic basin. The basin itself is uh, filled up with more than three to five kilometers of sediments. So it's incredible. We only touched the surface. In the deep drilling here, we went down twice to about 260 and 270 uh, 270 meters. Okay. So what we, what we did during the last years with the drill cores, uh, you see these two overlapping long cores reaching nearly 280, 260 meters. We try to um, combine them and to construct a composite uh, by comparing all of the data available. First of all, of course, the description of the material and the MSCL log data, and then later we uh, at other data which were available, high resolution MS, and then latest step was um, to add the XRF results. And of course, my colleague uh, Martin Trout, he's going to try to do the whole scanning uh, composite with uh, MATLAB, and then we will like to compare which is what is better, the MATLAB statistic composite core or our handmade composite core. At the moment, we are working with the first version of this composite core, and you see it here. Uh, in order to, uh, we did that, I have to mention, in order to gap some of the, uh, uh, to bridge some of the gaps we have in each core, these white layers here. But you see most of the, the color dominating here is green, that means it's clay silt, silty material. So of course we also have some sand layers but uh, we are pretty uh, happy to have at least a nice uh, also lacustrine story. And uh, from Christmas time last year, it was like a Christmas present to me, uh, Alan Dino uh, delivered his first argon-argon dates on crypto tephras, and so it was uh, proven that we didn't promise too much uh, after his calculation, and you see that's uh, a bit uh, in line, uh, happily, we covered at least the last 550,000 years, so we are pretty sure that the story or the evolution of the anatomically modern humans will be covered by our core. So uh, putting all the so far available uh, edge data together, we have radiocarbon only here in the uppermost part, then a lot of work uh, is in progress uh, by uh, Helen Roberts and Melissa Shepard and they gave me this nice traffic light uh, to say, okay, don't trust too much the red indicated here in the middle. They are still in progress, uh, and they promised me not to change them up to here, but to uh, shorten the error bars uh, in the next month. But you see, uh, at the moment, we are pretty happy with that uh, first H model, but of course, we still have to do this here, and um, we will not only use these three um, possibilities, but also uh, Paleomac data. Uh, and Jana just promised me to start with the measurements in May. I hope she will. Okay, let me now give you some first uh, results. Very important is to understand the meaning behind our proxies, like always. So um, here you see the catchment of the area with the most um, prominent and, and easy distinguishable uh, rocks available there. And of course, uh, the material we find here in our core is 
uh, dominated by the composition of the source rock in the catchment, but also by weathering processes and transport. We have to understand that too. And last but not least, by diagenetic processes in the basement itself after the sedimentation. And that means uh, clay, mineral production, whatever. This is something we have to understand in order to interpret at least the geochemical, geochemical proxies correctly. And uh, as you heard by Tom a couple of minutes before, you, uh, there was a very nice and pronounced uh, humid period in the northern hemisphere, or let's say at least in the northeastern part of uh, Africa, the so-called African humid period. And that was nicely recovered by our potassium proxy from in the short course. Uh, this uh, you see is plotted here against ages, so this is nicely um, uh, signing the younger dryers from the northern hemisphere, and then we had uh, this uh, uh, humid phase again, and then coming down to more um, arid and dry conditions. But we ask ourselves, what is the mechanism behind that proxy, potassium, I mean? And then we try to uh, decipher it and doing some X-ray analysis. You can see it here, especially in the time frame from uh, humid conditions to the uh, following the transition here. Um, to drier conditions. And you see the results over here. What we can observe is in the X-ray diffraction pattern that there is um, a changing in the peaks from smectite to uh, uh, illite. And then later on, you can also see uh, going up to more uh, arid and hyper-arid conditions here, we have also a peak of analcime. So what we can consider so far is that during the during the, um, the drier phases, um, there are some clay minerals and other uh, minerals showing up, which are typically produced during drier, uh, under drier climate condition, physical weathering, higher uh, salinity in the lake. Okay, the same indications we have from the oxygen isotope. This is work done by Jonathan Dean and Manalin Lang. And they did it on the uh, autogenic calcite. And what we uh, put on top here is the uh, Bentic stack by uh, Lisicki. And we only use the, this very initial H model, so there's no other tie point than the base H here. And you see it fits nicely, more or less, so far. And we interpret our data uh, with less evaporation during the, under a humid wetter climate during the uh, interglacials and uh, drier conditions for the glacial periods. But what is really remarkable is that we can uh, figure out here a very high amplitude in the time frame from about 130 to about 60,000 years. The same is true for the 40 meter core we drilled in the center. And much lower um, changing of the, of the amplitude here in the time frame of MRS3. So we suggest that maybe these high fluctuation and high amplitudes here in this time frame uh, put a lot of pressure on our human ancestors in order to develop new strategies, new tools, and to become more mobile to at least leave uh, Africa and uh, uh, move over to other continents. So uh, the penultimate slide is to give you some ideas about our outreach work. I would like to invite you, if you have the time, to come to Germany to uh, visit the Neanderthal Museum. There is a, um, an exhibition starting on the 13th of May these days, about two million years of migration, very important topic in Germany at the moment, also politically. And then we have uh, a very nice exhibition by our artist in resident, Julian Radock, also starting these days in March. You are invited to come to Aberystwyth to have a look to that. Uh, he was together with us in the field and put his artist uh, view of science on that exhibition. Okay, to conclude, I'll leave you alone because I overcome the time. I can do it, thank you. Okay, so repeat it. Uh, we, at the moment, what we know is that Chauba here uh, is uh, covering uh, more or less 550,000 years. Uh, we have some... Uh, First correlations, only based, of course, on the initial edge model, uh, to known climate shifts. 
And uh, what I didn't mention is that we also see uh, the climate was mainly driven by orbital para parameters, mostly eccentricity and precession. And most important for our main question is that we have hints that there is a very pronounced uh, climatic shift in the climate parameters visible starting at 130 key to 60 key, and that might have put some high pressure on anatomically modern humans to develop, as I mentioned, new behaviors. Maybe that is part of the story. I don't know. We're still going on to that. And I would like to uh, encourage you to stay connected to our uh, email and uh, uh, internet addresses. And Henry, this is Henry's part, he asked me to put the slide of uh, the INQUA 2019. I know it's still time, but don't forget to come to INQUA meeting to see the development, not only of this project. Thank you very much. In some lakes from Eastern Africa, there is a change in the amplitude of, of climate change as a function of um, overall insulation as sort of an eccentricity cycle. So when there's very high eccentricity, then you have yeah. more pronounced changes. Do, I mean, you don't, you're not at quite the stage to pull that out yet, but do you? I, I, I cut that out of the slide. Okay. Because of you in time, but I think shortly maybe we can. Okay. We have that <laughs> connection to, to the uh, precession cycle. But with that very first eight ball, I would like to be very careful to, to go further deep in this discussion. But uh, I hope with the uh, with, uh, 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 second eight uh, model, we hopefully could present at the end of this year yeah. uh, something, or your question will be much easier to answer. Yeah. It would be interesting to look at how yes. the, the north-south phasing of, of course, that goes yeah. with the very abrupt events in the south yeah. and maybe not. Um, hi, everyone. So I'm going to be talking about um, basically uh, most of what I've been doing the past three years um, at Brown University with Jim Russell. Um, so this will be a bit of a synthesis of some precipitation records um, spanning the Playa Pleistocene. So um, we're going to be testing uh, many uh, environmental as well as evolutionary hypotheses um, with these new independent climate records. Um, and we want to know what the, mean, uh, what the mean climate state is doing throughout the Playa Pleistocene as well as what, um, the uh, sorry, what the variability will be doing. Um, and these will help us understand the drivers of climate in East Africa. Then I'll be bringing it together and talking about um, how this relates with hominin evolution. So we see um, a lot of records trending from this um, wet to, to dry um, um, uh, mode um, in terms of C4 expansion. And we see that a lot in um, carbon isotope records um, as well as in um, these fossil records um, increasing the percentage of grazing species. Um, and we want to know if the precipitation also increased or if this aridification is caused by something else. Um, um, and so to, uh, to understand these reconstructed um, climate signals, we need to understand the Pleistocene climate forcing. So up here we have, um, oh, some things didn't show up over here, but up here we have um, the uh, mean insulation from 20 degrees north, which is the driver of the, um, e of the monsoon. And so you can see that um, precession is the dominant variability, whereas eccentricity um, serves to amplify this signal. And we also do not see a trend in the mean climate. Um, but in the benthic stack, in this ice volume record, we do see a trend. Um, yeah, so it goes from the Pliocene with uh, very little variability in the ice volume in the northern hemisphere um, uh, high latitudes. Um, and then it, after the onset of northern hemisphere glaciation, we see an increase in the variation as well as a, um, a, a decrease, or sorry, an increase in the ice volume. Um, and so can we, we can think about the variability as well as the mean um, to understand what's driving the climate in East Africa. Um, so this is just one of many uh, wonderful African climate records that we have um, as a framework. So this is the um, East African uh, rift lake um, synthesis. So we have time um, going up this direction as well as different um, East African lake basins going across. And you can see that um, these uh, blue blocked areas um, signify deep lake uh, um, signatures and that they're fairly synchronous um, through time among the different basins. 
Um, and so these actually correspond with high eccentricity. So we see a dominating um, insulation effect um, in these records, but in other records, such as the dust and the sea surface temperature records, we see more influence from the high latitudes. Um, so to really disentangle this, we need to um, we need more uh, continuous records um, of terrestrial precipitation to determine what's driving the climate and what um, the hominins were experiencing in East Africa. So that brings me to the hominin sites in Paleo Lakes drilling project, with which um, Frank nicely introduced, um, but I'm going to do again. And <laughs> so this is a project that's um, drilled six lakes um, in the East African Rift system. And um, these lakes span various times, uh, as well as hominin species. Um, and I'm going to focus on northern Awash here. Uh, this is a paleo lake, um, which spanned the Pliocene. So it's, um, it's covering Australopithecus afarensis. And I'm also going to be comparing this to West Turkana, which is still a lake today. Um, and, but the core that I'm looking at is early Pleistocene. So I'm going to get a record of Pliocene and Pleistocene and compare the two. So the way I'm going to do this is with um, delta D of wax. So leaf waxes are produced by uh, terrestrial plants to prevent from um, evaporation as well as uh, physical damage. These waxes are then ablated from the leaves and deposited into lakes. Um, they're made up of hydrocarbon chains, which means that we can measure the isotopes from both hydrogen and carbon. Um, and I'm going to be focusing on the hydrogen today, although I've done some um, carbon analyses uh, for paleovegetation. So hydrogen um, in these leaf waxes um, is directly related to the hydrogen in the precipitation. And the precipitation hydrogen isotopes um, in, the, oops, in the tropics are, um, are dominated by the amount effect. So the more and more it rains, the more heavy isotopes are removed from the system, and you'll get a more depleted signature. So here we have the Turkana core up here in a false color core image, um, as well as the hydrogen data. And you can see that wet is uh, more negative. So wet is our always going to be up in this. Um, and also the Turkana record will, uh, will be in orange for the rest of the talk. Um, I've also shown the carbon, um, the paleo vegetation, so the C3, C4 record. Um, I'm not going to go into it because I only have 12 minutes. But um, generally, these, uh, these um, interpretations between hydrogen and carbon um, are fairly similar. Um, and the biggest um, conclusion that we found from just this record is that um, insulation is uh, driving the variation in this record, and I'll be talking about that a little later. This is the Awash record. Here's the, um, here's the false color core image with the hydrogen data. Um, and again, wet is up. Um, this age model only has uh, two points within these uh, 300,000 years. Um, and so this is it's a little rough, but, <laughs> but um, I've, pl I've pl plotted it here with insulation as well. So now we can compare Pliocene and Pleistocene precipitation amount. Um, I took away the x-axis, uh, so there wasn't a lot of blank space. But um, So this is the Pliocene, the Awash record, and the um, Turkana record from uh, the early Pleistocene. And the first thing to note is that the means are quite different. Um, they're 50 per mil different, and I'll be talking about what that means. Um, and if you, we plot the, um, the Holocene average, this is an average from three different records from um, nearby these lakes. Um, you can see that it's, it's pretty similar to the early Pleistocene. So it seems like it's held steady um, from then. Of course, there's a lot of uh, time gaps in this. Um, and so to disentangle any effects that um, the regional aspects may have, so Ethiopia versus Kenya, um, we, we're, uh, I'm using uh, two Holocene records. So this is from Lake Tana, Ethiopia, which is um, quite close to Awash, and also um, Turkana here. Um, and so you can see that the means are about 20 per mil different. Um, and this could have to do with uh, Ethiopia being on the, uh, the a later stage of the transport path of the moisture source. So this could be an added uh, source effect to the amount effect. Um, it could also be because um, in modern times, um, Awash is uh, wetter than in, um, than in Kenya. But this 20 per mil difference is much less than the 50 per mil difference that we see between the Pliocene and the Pleistocene, um, showing that the Pliocene was indeed wetter. Um, Another thing to note is that the ranges um, amongst the records are similar. They're the same. <laughs> um, and so when we put uh, this 60 per mil 
range here on the Holocene record um, and then compare it with the Pliocene and Pleistocene, we can see that the ranges actually stayed um, fairly similar. Um, of course, this has to do with other things like the length of the record and stuff like that. Um, but this, uh, the range of East African precipitation amount um, persisted through time. And if we think about that um, benthic stack, the Northern Hemisphere uh, glaciation signal, um, this does not support that um, very small variation that we see in that. So this supports um, insulation being the driver of the um, climate variation despite that um, wetting, uh, sorry, um, aridifying trend that we saw um, before. So if we single out the West Turkana record, um, uh, this record has um, a distinct variability packet. Um, and this packet is um, distinguished with this moving variance in the white line, um, as well as this, this interval of very low variability. Um, and so this is further evidence for, this is eccentricity here. This is further evidence for um, insulation being the driver of the climate in East Africa, at least during the Pleistocene. When we look at the Pliocene record, um, it's much less clear, and this could have to do with uh, the age model um, restricting us from um, making these comparisons. Um, but it also should be noted that this record um, has a more sort of uh, constant variance as opposed to the Turkana record, um, which could be interesting. Um, so to show <laughs> the same figure that Frank showed, um, this is a nice schematic just to um, test various hominin evolutionary um, hypotheses. And so we have the environmental variable in white, which I've produced as a squiggly line. And um, these color blocks represent um, intervals of um, um, hominin evolutionary transitions, such as speciations, extinctions, um, dispersals. And so if we see um, these evolutionary transitions happening during a stable habitat, or a uh, progressive change or a more variable habitat that will test um, different hominin evolutionary hypotheses. And the variability selection hypothesis here at the end posits that more variability, strong, um, wet, dry uh, transitions selects for more, um, more adaptable species. And so when we compare this variability packet in this Turkana um, record, we actually do find that there are various hominin evolutionary transitions. We have extinctions and dis um, sorry extinctions and speciations, as well as um, the onset of um, Acheulean stone tools in this yellow star, and it's tempor temporary uh, sorry temporally close to the um, erectus uh, dispersal out of Africa. Um, so this would this would support the variability selection hypothesis, while as the Awash record um, needs more analysis. So in conclusion, we have um, we do see th this African aridification that other records um, that other records find. Um, the Pliocene was um, in on average wetter, um, but the variability was as variable as um, the Pleistocene, which is um, actually a little surprising. Um, but these two, uh, this um, supports that insulation is the driver of East African climate during this time. Um, and when we put this into the context of hominin evolution, um, the Turkana record supports this variability selection hypothesis, whereas the Awash record, again, is um, less clear. And hopefully with a, a better age model, we'll, we'll um, make, some, make some more significant conclusions. Thanks. You made a comparison between Tana and Turkana in the range of the isotopic signature, mm. but you didn't point out that Tana is probably about a thousand meters higher than, uh, than Turkana. Would that make a difference to than your interpretation? Um, yeah, probably very much. Um, <laughs> yeah, it would, it would be wetter. Um, what would be, oh, oh. <laughs> um, yeah, that would be different. I'm not sure how far it is from Awash. Um, it's, it's further, so okay. About the same distance in altitude. Okay. Okay, yeah, that would, that would definitely change. Um, we also can use the offshore record um, um, for those similar comparisons, but that was also similar. Yeah. Very nice presentation. Um, what about your carbon isotope signal? Does it also show the Pliocene being wetter than the that has not been measured. Oh, 
Good answer. I didn't show it. <laughs> I didn't show it because it hasn't been measured. It doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah. Today I'd like to present to you a longer term record of African hydroclimate based on the dust export from Northern Africa. Uh, so apologies for the slight change in the title from, from advertised. I will still touch on the same topic and I'm happy to discuss in more detail with anyone who's interested. Um, so this, is, uh, this work is part of an ERC grant and is a collaboration between a large group of people. So the Sahara Desert is a major dust source today, producing about half of the world's dust, which acts to modify the atmospheric energy balance and also fertilizes the Atlantic Ocean and even the Amazon rainforest. But the, um, the, the time in which the present hyperaridity uh, first developed in the Sahara region is still debated somewhat. So the, um, though we find evidence of coastal sand dunes back as far as possibly the um, even to the Cretaceous, certainly to the Oligocene, most people would put the age of the Sahara at about 2.7 million years ago. So, for example, in this study of Al-Mali, oops, they, um, they find this major aridification step associated with the intensification of northern hemisphere glaciation and a reorganization of atmospheric circulation. More recently, this viewpoint started to be challenged a bit more. So in the study by Schuster et al., they find some uh, sand dunes in the northern Chad Basin, and they date them about seven million years ago and suggest then that the Sahara Desert must have been at least this old, although this paper wasn't without some controversies. However, following up from the Schuster work, um, this uh, modeling study by Zhang et al. shows a mechanism for aridification in the late Miocene due to the closure of the Tethys and the exposure of the Arabian Peninsula, and that's been shown to lead to an aridification of northern Africa. So, I'm sort of taking a slightly different tack to the other speakers so far, and in order to look at terrestrial climate, we've been looking at marine sediment cores. Uh, the main reason for this is that they're much more continuous. We don't tend to struggle with the, um, some of the erosional issues that you can get, or periods of non deposition with continental records, and also chronology is much easier, so we can really narrow down our time, um, our age model. So the site that I'm looking at is Ode Ocean Drilling Project Site 659, which is situated here under the main Saharan dust plume, or summer Saharan dust plume today. The images on the right show three examples of what the sediment cores from this site look like. So on the left, you've got a Pleistocene one, in the middle, a Pliocene, and on the right, a Miocene. You can notice all three of these sites show strong color variation between dark layers, which the high lithic content, so a large amount of terrigenous material coming in from the continent, and paler layers where we've got more of a dominance of the marine um, carbonate productivity but with lower terrigenous inputs. And you can also notice, as well as this sort of high frequency variability within each of the cores, there's of evidence of long-term trends just by how, how distinct those three time intervals are. So the potential of this site as a recorder of African dust was shown by Tiedemann et al. in the 90s. And they basically assumed that all the terrigenous material in this site is dust and has come from North Africa. And they produced a high resolution record over the last five million years. But since this paper came out over 20 years ago, there's evidence of um, paleo river channels being found on the North African margin and studies of sediment cores over the last glacial cycle show evidence of riverine material making it out into the ocean. So this gave us a reason to go back and reassess and look in more detail at this study. And also we wanted to extend the record further back in time. So Though they focused on the last five million years, but we wanted to go back and then look at this time interval back to seven million years where we found these dunes. And also this interval from around sort of eight to six million years is particularly notable for the major expansion of C4 grasslands. So we wanted to look and understand what hydroclimate was doing through that interval. So plotted, you can see in black is the record of Tiedemann et al. Um, and red is our new record. So we've generated this by XRF core scanning. Um, so here we've just used the calcium ion ratio of the sediments, and you can see it correlates really well with the more time-consuming method that they use. So we have something that we can take back, and now we can study in higher resolution, we can cover this longer time period. And you can see in these two sort of zoom-in sections that in this, um, in, this in the um, sort of uh, Pleistocene boundary interval that we have really good agreement with, their ex with the existing data, when we go back to older records, such as around five million years shown on the right, we can really increase the resolution and add new power. And another important reason to do XRF is that 
it, we don't just generate this, we don't have to rely on this assumption that all the terrigenous material is dust. We can reassess this by looking in more detail at the geochemistry and we can test whether this, whether all the lithic material is dust, even back in the sort of more humid climates of the past. So these are the re some of our records that we've generated from the site. So this is our 11 million year history. Uh, the bottom panel in red is just the terrigenous accumulation rate, akin to those records of Tiedemann, but stretching further back. The top two panels show two different geochemical ways of assessing this idea of is it dust that we're recording, how much riverine material is reaching the site. So in the top panel, we've got the ratio of aluminium and iron over silicon, potassium, and titanium. Um, and the idea behind this is it's been shown by Melitza et al. in 2010 that modern Sahara dust and Senegal River suspension samples have very different signatures shown with those two colored bars. So what we can do is we can look at our lithic fraction at site 659 and we can understand how much dust versus how much riverine material is coming to the site. And you can see that through most of the record, although we're closest to the dust, there is definitely an influence of riverine material and sometimes up as high as 50% towards the, in the sort of middle interval. The second panel is um, we've used the zirconium rubidium ratio. Now the idea behind this is that it's been shown, at least with the modern system, that dust is much coarser than the riverine materials in this region. Zirconium rubidium acts as a grain size proxy, so zircon is typically found in coarse grains, it's hard to break down. Rubidium is often rich in river clays. So this gives us, so pointing upwards, shows where you've got large amounts of high coarse grain dust coming in. Um, and those where the values are lower, we've got again more riverine clays. So looking at the broad picture in these records, we find sort of three main phases in this um, North African climate evolution. So in the oldest part, we can see our dust fluxes are, are the lowest, which is unsurprising in a time that's thought to be before major deserts in, in North Africa. But what surprised us slightly is when we look at these two ratios for um, sort of dust versus riverine input, both of them actually show that it's still a dust-dominated system. So the dotted lines coming across show you the average values for the last million years. And we're not too far away from that. And it should also be noted we've got strong, um, strong orbital scale variability all the way back. So we have times of where it looks like high dust coming in, orbitally four, so dominantly precession signals, all the way back to 11 million years. The system changed significantly about 6.5 million years ago, where suddenly we start seeing some really humid events coming in. Um, and it's notable that it, this is around this time is the growth of Lake Chad. And we also see a kick up in the amount of dust that's coming in in the intervening arid bits between these, these humid intervals. So we hypothesize that the larger water bodies across the continent in the humid periods when insulation is favorable leave behind a lot of fine grain material, which is then easily deflated in the intervening arid periods and really kicking up our dust fluxes. And then the second major transition in the record comes at this intensification of northern hemisphere glaciation. So this, this classic aridification step that we see in our records too. So we see our highest dust fluxes in the arid Pleistocene, and geochemically we are in a dust dominated system. So I mentioned before about this orbital variability throughout. This is just a zoom in in one section of it to, to illustrate what we see. So here we're looking between about 3.3 and 2.3 million years. So the top two panels are my same two geochemical dust proxies that I've shown. And in red, we've got calcium iron. And the background <coughs> image is one of the core photo is the core photograph, which is aligned with the data. So you can see this color banding all the way through these dark light um, intervals. And it should be noticed that we, every time we have a dark band, it's, we see this high, high dominance of dust, and again, high amounts of coarse material. And we find this relationship holds throughout the whole 11 million year record. So every time we get one of these dark bands, it looks like we're still getting significant dust coming to the site. And you can also see how well it matches the insulation record in yellow. So at times where we've got high variability in in insulation is where we see clusterings of the dark bands, nice clear cycles in our, in our lithic elements. When you come to these eccentricity minima where precession is quite dampened, we, have, we show a more, a more sort of stable climate. So we don't see the big variability cycles. And you can see the mud stays relatively pale in color. We seem to be stuck more in a humid phase. So hopefully we've put together a bit of a case that we had dust export from Africa, at least in short, Short, um, short periods back to 11 million years ago. But are we looking at a Sahara desert 
Or are we looking more at the signature of coastal sand dunes, for example? One way we decided to test this is by looking at the radiogenic isotope signature of the lithic material, which is shown up here. So we've got a cross plot between the strontium isotopes and the neodymium isotope signature. Our data is shown by these crosses here. And the color of the cross marks the, rubidiums, um, the zirconium rubidium ratio. So those in, in red and orange are times where we've got signals that suggest there's a lot of coarse grain material. Where we've got blues and purples, there's more of a, a fine grain signature. So if you notice, a lot of the reds and yellows are plotting closer to these fields, which are based on, um, based on data by Sherman et al, who mapped out the different provinces. Um, so where we see these, these coarse grain, it's plotting closer to the Saharan dust and the Bodeli Depression field, which is the source of a lot of the dust today. Where we see a lot of the finer grain stuff, it tends to match more these coastal regions of Mauritania, Western Sahara, Senegal. So this is the opposite to if it was just a coastal dune signature. What we think is that the rivers are sampling more of these coastal regions and bringing more of that material to the site. While we still seem to be getting some dust from the interior of Africa being exported all the way through our record. Sorry, I should have said that these, these points cover a range of lithologies and a range of ages throughout our 11 million year record. So then finally, just to link this to the plant story of what's going on. So Rachel nicely introduced the idea of um, using plant waxes. Here we're just using them for their carbon isotope signature to try and understand the timing of the C3, C4 um, transition and whether there's a hydroclimate link to it. So our data points are shown in purple here. And you first thing you should no to note that the, um, the transition seems to be really quite gradational at this site from, from our record. So it seems to be stretching all the way back from about 11 million years up to about 1.5 million years. And I, and I don't think it's, it's just a pure signal of this site either. So in gray, uh, the records from Eastern Africa, but from Uno et al. And it's quite striking how similar the two trends are from opposite sides of the continent. So it looks like we've got at least a regional scale, scale signature here. And there also seems to be some relationship in this transition to these three phases of climate we find in our records. So in this oldest part, we see a sort of expansion of C4 grasslands, that's the carbon isotope shifts. Then in this middle interval where we see the really humid periods, actually the climate se this seems to slow down and there's very little change in, in the carbon isotope signatures before they then kick up again after the, after the late Pliocene for a little reversal in the youngest part. So it looks like hydroclimates may well have played a key role in this transition. So then just to summarize, it looks like there is some pu pulsing of dust exported from the interior of Africa Exactly how much dust you need to call well, the Saharan Desert is obviously an ongoing um, area of discussion, but it looks like at least we're picking some kind of a signal from the interior of the continent right back over the ele last 11 million years and potentially the, even beyond. So we suggest that the origin of the Sahara may well have preceded both this intensification of northern hemisphere glaciation and these alien, alien dunes found in the Jura region by um, Schuster et al. We see a big jump in the rainfall at during favorable orbits at about 6.5 million years ago, which seems to happen at about the same time of, as Mega Lake Chad. So again, possibly continental or at least a regional scale change rather than something that is unique to the sediment core. And this lasts well into the Pliocene. And our leaf wax biomarker records show that there's a close coupling between the sensitivity of the North African monsoon and the, the hydroclimate signals with this expansion of the C4 savanna ecosystems. Thank you. Okay, so today I'm going to present you some results of my PhD, and particularly the quantified 45,000 years long temperature and precipitation records that I derived from Southeast Africa. And these two records will help us to uh, discuss the glacial interglacial dynamic of the Southern African monsoon domain, so the region that is represented in green on the figure. So usually there are two broad mechanisms that are proposed to explain the variability. Either precessional forcing, which would modulate the, the north-south position of the, of the domain, or the um, thermal forcing that would modulate the intensity of the rain belt. So these two models can, at this time scale, they can explain what is observed in Eastern Africa. But they have opposed consequences for the climate of Southern Africa. Unfortunately, uh, until recently, we didn't have any quantification, any real data, the precipitation data from that region. So we couldn't really determine which one of these two mechanisms 
was the best uh, descriptor of the variability. But uh, with Brian, we have developed a new framework, a new statistical framework to extract uh, quantitative information from pollen data that can be applied in the region. So these are the different uh, records that I have selected for this study. And for all these different sites, we have reconstructed a mean, annual, mean annual temperature and uh, the amount of summer rainfall. So since uh, many of these records have been published uh, years ago and some, some of them decades ago, we, are, we have recalculated all the chronologies using the Bayes and model Bacon. So this figure synthesizes the chronologies with the, 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 the white bars representing the time covered by each record and the vertical segments, the different pollen sample. So and when summarized in this histogram at the bottom, we can see that we have a reasonable amount of samples for the Olesen section and a very good spatial coverage but if we go back in time, we can see that the amount of, of, of samples diminishes, and we only have uh, three records that um, cover the period before the LGM. And I must say that these records are, have also very low, uh, very bad chronologies. So uh, for the rest of the presentation, all the records I will present, for everything that, that uh, represents that period, only the very uh, broad variability should be analyzed and nothing uh, finer than the multimillennial variability. So we have developed that, that a CREST method that uh, helps that permit to extract uh, climate value, quantitative climate values from pollen data. To do that, we use uh, probability density functions, PDF, that uh, help to, to mathematically link uh, pollen data with climate. So to do that, we, uh, we extract, we have the distribution of uh, our species and we extract uh, the climate values that are associated to each presence record. And by combining all these, uh, these climate value, we can derive the, the curve there that represents, uh, cannot really see them, but uh, that represents the, the modern climatic niche of the species. But as you all uh, probably know, uh, the pollen is almost never identified at the, at the species level. So to, make the, to meet the taxonomic resolution of the pollen, we have to combine the different species PDF here, which we do with that equation that basically represents uh, an average of the species PDF. And we get that white curve here that represents uh, the link between the pollen and climate. And that's uh, that link that we propagate back in time to infer past climate. And to uh, estimate climate parameters, what we do is that for any given sample, we calculate the PDF of all the taxa observed and we multiply, uh, we multiply them together. And the mu multiplication ensures that the uh, reconstructed climate value will be in the coexistence interval of all, of all the taxa. And one advantage of, of this method is that as you will see in a couple of slides, we obtain the complete distribution of the probabilities, which, is, uh, which will help us uh, to derive robust uh, regional signal. So this uh, representation basically uh, represents how climate reconstruction are usually uh, plotted on figures with the best climate estimate and sometimes the confidence interval and the samples are linearly in interpolated. But what we have with our method, as I said, is the distribution of the probabilities on the climatic axis. But thanks to the uh, edge depth modeling technique I used, thanks to Bacon, we have also the same type of information on the X axis. Therefore, with uh, using a Monte Carlo, we, have, um, we can uh, create, uh, we can sample in this uh, probabilistic distribution to create alternative scenarios. And by combining a large number of these scenarios, we can derive pseudo continuous curves that in fact integrate much more information that just uh, the, the, the best climate estimate of each sample. And uh, the, the strength of this approach is that we, um, we obtain a continuous curve. Therefore, we can uh, compare different records together because they, they, they become interpolated on the same temporal axis. And by doing that, and by applying a second round of Monte Carlo, which I'm not fully describing here, but we can uh, extract regional climate trends so these are represent the different temperature reconstructions for different sites I showed you on the map at the beginning. And by uh, combining them together, we can derive that white curve that represents the evolution of uh, temperature in Southern Africa during the past 45,000 years. And if we compare that, that regional stack, so extracted from the different, uh, or the blue, the, the blue stars represent the different sites, and we compare with that completely independent SST record from the, from the Mozambique channel there, we can observe that we have a very good correlation during the past 45,000 years. I, th I think it's higher than point, uh, point 0.85. And if we look only at the, uh, the, the past 20,000 years, when we have a correlation that is higher than point 0.92, I think. That is during the period when we have the most samples and the most sites, that's when we obtain the, the best correlation. So this result in itself is not really 
surprising, but just saying that uh, continental, continental and oceanic temperatures are related. But considering the quality of the pollen sequences we used uh, as input data, it was really for us a great surprise to see something that was working that good and that gave us confidence to, to study uh, the past dynamic of the, of the monsoon domain. I am uh, presenting later today a dedicated poster on the method, so if you want to really know more about the details, because I, I, I skipped a lot of, um, lot of details, so if you want to talk more about the, the, the method, please come to my poster. I think it's poster 62. So now we have that, uh, by applying that framework to that region, we're going to be able to, to produce quantitative reconstruction on precipitation in the region, and we will be able to discuss the, the glacial, interglacial dynamic of the region. So the first result we got by applying our framework is that we reconstruct drier condition uh, during the last glacial period and wetter condition during the Holocene. But the most surprising result we observed that within the South African summer rainfall zone, a zone that is usually supposed to be homogeneous in terms of climate variability, we observed two clearly different trends. With the blue sites he here that, you can, that are located within the, the monsoon domain and the orange sites here located on the edge or right outside of the modern uh, monsoon domain. So for the rest of the presentation, I will focus on the, on the, on the northern stack, on the blue stack here, to, to, de to describe the, the monsoon variability. But I just want to highlight that, um, that we've been able to link that variability, in fact, to, to change in the merid meridional position of the uh, southern westerlies. That is, you know, within the sem uh, South African summer rainfall zone, we observe uh, a temperate influence. But I think Brian, in a couple of days, will talk about that a lot more than that. So go to his talk. So if we compare our uh, precipitation stack with that uh, local uh, record from the paleo attempt from Calder Cave, we can see that at the, uh, again, still at the, the, the larger time scale, we have a pretty good correlation between these two records with drier condition, reduced rainfall here, and a continuous increase during the, the, the Holocene with a peak uh, some time, like uh, 2002, yeah, 2000 years ago. So we can now think at, about uh, mechanistic. What, what is the mechanism that drives that, that rainfall viability? As I said at the beginning, there are basically two mechanisms that are usually proposed. Uh, precisional forcing, represented here locally by the summer insulation, or uh, thermal forcing, represented here by the, the sea surface temperature record from the Mozambique channel. And if we uh, look at these two, uh, two graphs, we can see some similarities for different time periods between the records but none of them is able to completely describe the full variability. But uh, the model we want to, to we, we present uh, today uh, is that a combination of both, uh, these both end members can, uh, can explain completely all the variability we observe. So this figure represents uh, the, 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 the correlation between uh, our precipitation record and the temperature record, but the correlation measure at different, with different uh, windows and at different moments on the record. So let me guide you through that figure. So on top of the figure, you can read the, cor the global correlation between the two records. And by going down on the y-axis, we reduce the size of that window. And on the x-axis, we move that window along, along the record. So uh, we generated the same figure for precipitation and insulation. So what we can say from these figures that at the glacial interglacial time scale, that is the upper half of these two figures, we have a much stronger relation between uh, precipitation and temperature. But what is surprising is that uh, we observe here during, uh, during the past 10 to 15,000 years, we have a, a change in the, in, the, in the strength of that relationship that even becomes negative during the late Holocene. But it is quite surprising because this represents the period when we have the most sites, the most samples, and the best chronologies. So this, this break in the relationship is, in fact, significant. It represents something real. And uh, surprisingly, we observed the, ex the exact opposite pattern with the insulation curve, with uh, no relationship at the glacial interglacial time scale. And during the past 10 to 15,000 years, we have a correlation that becomes uh, stronger and stronger. So the mechanism we propose is that at the glacial interglacial time scale, uh, the, the variability of temperature seems more important to drive rainfall variability in the regions. But as soon as we enter the Holocene, that is in a warmer world, uh, change in temperatures become less important, and it's really local insulation that, uh, that uh, drives changes in the, in the precipitation. <coughs> so to test that model, we have compared our records with the different uh, East African records here. So for instance, that uh, Delta 13C from Lake Malawi. And we can see that uh, globally, we observe something that is quite uh, consistent. If we go further north and look at Lake Tanganyika, 
uh, we observe something that is really different. But in fact, if we decompose that record in two parts with the uh, glacial deglacial uh, inter uh, deglaciation part and the Holocene, we can see that during uh, the deglacial section, we have a positive phasing between these two records, which is consistent with the variability of temperature. And if we look at the Holocene section, we observe something that is really different. But in fact, the pattern observed at Lake Tanganyika is in fact a clear signature of the event that, that's the African humid period. So, so in fact, this is not inconsistent with our model. We have a stronger imprint of insulation during the Holocene, even at Lake Tanganyika. But in fact, we can just refine our model by saying that the limit, in that region, the limit between the northern and the southern hemisphere insulation, insulation signal is not uh, the equator, as we may think, but rather a line located between the late, late latitudes of Lake Tanganyika and Malawi. And the final record I want to show you, and it took us uh, some time to, to really understand it, is that uh, Delta D record from the uh, from the Maric here of the Mozambique Basin. Is that if we just look at the Holocene section, we can see that we have again a pretty good correlation, consistent with insulation. But if we look at the deglacial section, and particularly these two uh, these two cold events of the northern hemisphere, we can see that we have. Uh, a response that is out of phase with our record, but also, I didn't show it here, but with Lake Tanganyika. So it took us quite a while to really understand that record, but in fact, oops, no, I need to shift that. It has been recently proposed by, um, by uh, Dinezio and Tierney that uh, the variability observed here would not be related to changes in the monsoon domain itself, but rather by a change in the uh, water circulation over the Indian Ocean, which would be eventually caused by the exposure of the Sundo shelf because of the lower sea level. So in fact, that record is, uh, doesn't, is not inconsistent with our model because it's, it could be driven by uh, something completely different. And that region, so that it's not completely clear which the, the extent of the region represented by that record, but there seems to be like there is that little region, that coastal region from southern Tanzania and Mozambique that uh, could have experienced such, such a variability related to changes in the uh, Indian Ocean. So to summarize the finding of this study, first we have been able to, to create a new framework that allowed us for the first time to extract quantitative um, values from the Southern African pollen data. Uh, we've been able to, 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 com to highlight that the, uh, during the, the, the Holocene, the, 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 multi the multimillennial viability during that time period is mainly driven by change in insulation with the Northern signature uh, 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 north of a line located between the Lake Tanganyika and Lake Malawi. And uh, during the, the glacial period, we have different patterns with drier conditions across almost of the region, except in that uh, small region here. But as I said, this is not related to the dynamic of the monsoon domain itself, but rather changes in the zonal circulation over the Indian Ocean. So thank you for your attention. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to give you a snapshot of the so-called RAIN project. The RAIN project was initially um, by five universities from Germany and South Africa, as you can see here, oops, as you can see here below, and it is funded by the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research. So what we are doing in, research, in RAIN is basically paleo-environmental reconstruction in all three rainfall zones of southern Africa, so the winter rainfall zone here in yellow, the summer rainfall zone here in green, and the year-round rainfall zone in between. In rain, we split up in five sub-projects. Sub-project one is dealing with lacustrian archives, that's basically me. Um, we are also working on marine sediments right in front of our terrestrial archives, and we have two overlapping sub-projects, one dealing with micropaleontology and one dealing with biomarkers, and finally we have a strong capacity building component. So we have already heard a lot about the summer rainfall zone in the last talk, so I will skip that. If you're interested in the winter rainfall zone, and mainly in our key site, the Florent Flay record. Please go and see Thomas Kasper, he's sitting over there. Maybe not now, but he has a nice poster which, he is, which is on display on Saturday morning. So if you're interested in the winter rainfall zone, please go and see Thomas on Saturday. I would like to focus today on the year-round rainfall zone and there mainly on the wilderness area. 
The wilderness area consists of a series of lakes that we can see here. Some of them are interconnected. Some of them are connected to the Indian Ocean, like these two. And I would like to tell you something about Lake Eilenflei and Lake Grünflei over here. Lake Grünflei has a very small catchment area and it is not connected to the Indian Ocean. So it was possible to recover a gravity core from Grünflei and this gravity core was 120 centimeters and it is dated by radiocarbon ages which nicely match the lead to 10 dating in the upper part. There was one shortcoming in this record, and this is this transition layer, or N hiatus, from about 1,200 to about 2,700 years before present, so we cannot say anything about climate during this time, but we try to do something with the rest of the time. There's another shortcoming that we see here, because the usual suspects for hydroclimate reconstruction, the mineralogenic input, cannot really be used in this archive, because the mineralogenic input indicators like titanium or aluminum, they just reflect short-time events. So those are just events coming in there, and there's no hydrological trends in there. And this can be seen in this transition layer, which is probably also caused by events, so a hiatus is there very likely. So we were looking for some other parameters and we found those parameters in the carbonate mineralogy. And the theory behind this is that the higher the ionic concentration and especially the magnesium content, the more likely it is that we have the precipitation of aragonite or dolomite. And the more fresh water we have, that means we have more precipitation in our system, the more likely it is that we have precipitation of carbonates there. So if we plot that on an h-axis, that would mean from about 4,200 to 2,700, we would have rather dry conditions in this area. And if we move upward from about 1,200 until present day, there would be a more wetter, a wetter signal. Of course, we would like to overcome this shortcoming here and have a continuous record. And that's why we now move on to the Aland Flay. Eilenflei has a freshwater input by the so-called Doiver River coming in here, and it is also connected to the Indian Ocean by the Serpentine Channel, which we see here. And both those influences, the freshwater input and the marine input, is reflected in our sediment core EV13, which was recovered in 2013, and it was 30.5 meters long. If we look at that sediment core, those are the original pictures. We already can see a color shift, or at least I can see it here, from darker colors to lighter colors. And if we play a bit with um, contrast and brightness, we can see different lithological units in this 30.5 meter core. And those lithological units, they're mostly um, due to variations in the marine influence. So here we have some marine influence indicators the first one is the calcium content, which reflects the precipitation of carbonates. The second one is salinity based on a transfer function from ostracots. And the third one is marine diatoms. And those three indicators, they show us that we have different intensities of marine impact on our system over time. And these different intensities, they also cause us problems with the chronology because the chronology of the Ellen Flay record is composed of 24 radiocarbon ages. And we have some wood samples in red, and the other samples are bulk samples in blue. And if we compare those two sample sets, we see that there is an offset, which is likely due to the um, marine influence. And if we look more closely, this offset isn't even constant, so we have, we have different lithological units in which the offset between the terrestrial samples and the bulk samples is varying. So what we did was we did take um, terrestrial samples and paired bulk samples and we tried to correct for our individual reservoir effects. So coming up with a delta R in the uppermost part of the record with 252 years and going up to a reservoir effect of a delta R of 820 years in the lower part. If we correct our bulk ages for those delta Rs, we come up with this nice fitting yeah, chronology, and we can apply a Bacon model on that. 
We finally checked that with paleomagnetic secular variation chronology uh, tests in order to see if our chronology is robust. So now we can start with a paleoenvironmental reconstruction. And also in Ellen Flay, it's not really possible to use the usual suspects, mini um, the mineralogenic input indicators, because the mineralogenic input indicators, as we can see here in the principal component analyses, they are diluted by the marine impact and vice versa. So it's not a first order relationship between the mineralogenic input and impact and hydrological variations. Therefore, we were also looking for other proxies. We came up with a chemical index of alteration. And the idea um, with a chemical index of alteration is that the more precipitation we have in the catchment, the moister it is and the higher the weathering is, and then we get a higher chemical index of alteration. If we look at that during the past 9,000 years, we see slight variations from about 9,000 to 3,000 years. And from 3,000 years onwards, we have a distinct shift towards wetter conditions. So this is the CIA, which I just explained. And what we are doing here is we do compare it to other proxies from this record. And the first one we want to compare is the diatom PC1, which is um, an indicator for freshwater input. So the more freshwater input we have, the wetter it was in the catchment area. And we also compare to the Afro-Montane Forest taxa pollen, which are also a hydrological indicator in this area. And if we compare those two records, we have nice similarities, especially in the upper part from about 3,000 until present day when we get this shift to wetter conditions. If we now try a regional comparison, we come back to the Grünflay record, to the calcite record over here. And we can also see that we have this shift towards wetter conditions from 3,000 until present day there. And interestingly, we have a uh, comparison which nicely matches with the sea surface temperatures of Antarctica, where we have a similar observation. There, when we have higher sea surface temperatures, we observe that we have the same shift to wetter conditions in the wilderness area. But how can we explain this? We have a very simple model here. We just take into account circulation, but no ocean currents in this time. We're just about to explore the ocean currents together with Brian, uh, the role of the ocean currents. And the idea here is that the sea surface temperature, they are mirroring the Antarctic sea ice extent. So what we have here is a very contracted sea ice, meaning that the, weather, uh, the southern westerlies, they are very south. And that means that the easterlies bring precipitation to our coring site. And additionally, we have cutoff lows and ridging highs, which bring even more precipitation to that area. In contrast, we have rather dry conditions at the west coast. If we now expand the Antarctic sea ice, the westerlies, they are moving northward. They are somehow blocking the easterlies. The influence of the cutoff lows and the ridging highs get, is getting less and we get wetter conditions in the winter rainfall zone or in the west coast, whereas we have less um, wetter conditions in the south coast. So we have this kind of antiphase pattern which we currently see in this record. In order to test if this relationship between the south coast and the west coast, in our case, persists over longer time scales, we also compared to the aridity index by Stuttgart et al. 2002, and as the two records I just showed you are simply too short, they're just covering the Holocene, I'm showing you brand new data from the Van Kerfels Flay Fen, which is located over here, which we recovered last year. We applied a multi-proxy approach going back about 40,000 years, and I'm just presenting the delta D of the C31 analkanes here. And as we've heard in the last but one talk, normally they are interpreted in this way that the more enriched the delta D is, the drier it is, and the less enriched they are, the moister it is. For your convenience, I just flipped the aridity index to be in the same direction. And if we do the comparison now, we see in stage three, marine isotope stage three, we have dry conditions in the south coast when we have wetter conditions in the west coast. 
During the Holocene, we have wet conditions or the wetter conditions in the south coast, whereas we have drier conditions in the west coast. And in between, we have this hiatus here, which is probably due to very dry conditions there, and this matches nicely with the moistest conditions in the west coast. So this brings me to my conclusions. If we want to do a proper paleoenvironmental reconstruction in South Africa based on sediments, we do need a multi-proxy approach, and as we have seen, we do need a multi-archive approach because one is simply not enough. Dating is of major importance, as we have seen. During the past 40,000 years, um, the precipitation in wilderness, or at least in our Wankersfels flake core, seems to be opposite to the precipitation pattern at the west coast. And if we go to the Holocene, we have nice similarities between the precipitation reconstructed in wilderness and the Antarctic sea ice extent. Thanks. I'm going to speak to you uh, a little bit about uh, rock art site uh, in Western Kenya that I and my colleagues have uh, 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 excavated to see the relationship between the archaeology, uh, um, archaeological material deposited at the site and the rock art um, at the site itself. So um, Kakapel is uh, located near the border of Kenya and Uganda by uh, just at the base of uh, Mount Telgon and um, uh, the area is generally uh, uh, inhabited with uh, a lot of settlements and the site itself is surrounded by a lot of uh, uh, settlements and, and cultivated land. Uh, on the ground, that is what it looks like. Uh, uh, there are huge uh, rock boulders, granite boulders around it, and the site is a national monument in Kenya, managed by the National Museums of Kenya in the local community. So what we have here is the cultural center, the approach of the site from the cultural center. And from the top of the boulders around the site, that's what it looks like below, um, very intensively cultivated and, and settled. Um, and then of course, um, talking of uh, the general environment, uh, high up, uh, it's, it's this rocky and so settlements are not um, very common in where you have uh, the rocks, but in the lower areas, uh, you see uh, more cultivation. The site uh, looks like this. It's developed by the community for, um, for visitors to have a look at. And that's the rock panel that has the rock art just behind this boulder. And that's what it looks like. Uh, the rock art is uh, in that area. And when you look at it closely, you have um, various kinds of images. These images have been um, attributed to uh, pastoralists and hunter-gatherers in the past, but uh, a fresh look at it uh, shows some images that we could attribute to uh, um, farmers, early farmers uh, entering this area. So we, we're dealing with different cultural groups uh, through time inhabiting the area, and our interest uh, at the beginning was to know uh, what prompted the different um, uh, cultural groups to to settle in the area. So we are looking at um, you know cultural context for habitation, but also trying to find out what what environments prevailed um, to to um, allow them settle in this area. Um, the other interesting thing about this site uh, is that um, the rock art is very um, comparable to what you have at other uh, rock art sites in the in the region of Western Kenya. Eastern Uganda and, and even the Lake Victoria region. So um, what the kinds of rock art that you find are uh, these kinds of, of geometric images uh, in these Ugandan sites, uh, those very interesting images. And if you look at that and that and, and this one, they are very close. And there are many others um, on the main, the main panel at, at um, Kakapet that is very comparable to this one. Uh, you have uh, images of, of animals of different kinds. Some are wild, others are indeterminate. And so uh, this kind of relationship or this kind of similarity of rock art over such um, a wide, uh, I mean, a big region um, led us to think that maybe uh, it was the same people doing the 
um, the, the, the rock art at the, at the different places uh, around the same times so or even different times, or that the environment um, necessitated maybe um, cultural interactions between uh, these people, or maybe there's some other way in which um, you know, they managed to do uh, similar rock art uh, through time. And so uh, we conducted excavations at the site. Uh, we did um, uh, three trenches and recovered um, a lot of uh, artifacts, uh, both lithic um, and pottery, but we also had a lot of animal remains uh, at this site. So um, in one of our surveys, uh, extending into eastern Uganda, we came across this site, it's recorded, but there was something very interesting about the decorations on the pottery shards that we encountered there. So when we go back to um, the images I showed of, of, the, um, of the rock art panels, we, we got um, you know, concentric circles similar to these, but of what, one of the other sites at um, Nyero 2, we have uh, you know, uh, these kinds of lines in paintings that, we, that are referred to as ladder-like because nobody can really um, describe them well enough to know exactly what they are. So the representation of the um, motifs, as they're called, um, on rock art, also on the pottery, is um, very interesting because we try to, we sort of uh, try to relate what you are having in the material culture, that is the remains from, uh, you know, people's past cultures in this, uh, in this area, also in the rock art. And that's, um, that places uh, the rock art makers and the makers of the pottery together, culturally, either in time or uh, in space. Somehow they interacted and they might have had um, some kind of relationship that led them to do, um, you know, the same kind of art on pots and on uh, and on, on, on rock surfaces. Um, uh, pots uh, from Kakapel, the site that we excavated, follow the same trend again. We have um, decorations that are not exactly like this, but are closer, what we call um, abstract, uh, uh, I mean, paintings in the rock art. And then we have uh, the wavy lines, which we also get to see, but, um, these we don't have in the paintings, but we have uh, paintings that are associated with the time period when we have these kind of decorations on pot. So um, these um, are um, hunter-gatherer uh, uh, kinds of uh, uh, modification on pots, and we have uh, you know hunter-gatherer uh, uh, painting at the site. We have uh, pastoralist. Um, Mm, decorations on pots, and we also have uh, pastoralist um, paintings at the site, and then of course the Iron Age pottery, and we have uh, you know abstract paintings in white uh, that represent uh, farmers at the site. Uh, stone tools at the site are um, very crappy, if you want to say, <laughs> <laughs> if you want to think in terms of crappy stone tools, because the they don't, they don't look very well made, uh, but they are very significant in a way that you have uh, a few pieces that are, uh, we call formal uh, microliths uh, because they form, they fall within the crescents and, um, and trapezoids category of, of lithic artifacts, but they're generally in very um, not so nice uh, stone raw materials, and so they're not, they're not very good, and they're not, um, there isn't a large collection of formal tools that you can actually uh, ascribe to, um, you know, specific later Stone Age periods, but uh, because we do not have anything that is also specifically uh, earlier Stone Age periods, this fits more in the, in the later Stone Age uh, periods, and we are thinking in terms of uh, later hunter-gatherers uh, being at this site, they may be the ones who made the hunter-gatherer uh, paintings that we are thinking of at this site. Uh, the tool types, as I was saying, are not, not very good uh, and are not very formal. So what you might want to call uh, formal are just these. And if you look at the, uh, you know, at the Persia, there are really uh, just a few of them. And then you have the more large and, and crude uh, weapons, I mean, uh, tools around uh, in those areas. And these are mostly uh, pounding tools. So uh, 
it's, it's assumed that most of the um, you know, functions attributed to these were um, uh, pounding, uh, maybe plant material pounding. But raw materials are also generally local to this place. We have a few uh, nice pieces that could be uh, from outside, but uh, we understand that obsidian probably comes from very far away from this area. And that's uh, one of the reasons why formal tools are, are very few. And then um, the fauna, uh, we have a large uh, collection, but it's very fragmented and uh, uh, they don't seem to represent like very varied um, environments if you look at it, but you have uh, a lot of uh, small mammals that uh, uh, inhabit um, different microenvironments in you know a large area. So uh, while there are only just a few, they might represent uh, very small um, uh, habitat differences uh, around the site. So they don't give like um, a large scale or um, a large scale environment view, view of, of the area. And then of course, um, talking of the fragmentary nature of the, of the assemblage, we are not also able to identify a lot of the um, specimens to species because there are very f uh, few uh, identifiable specimens and uh, the teeth are also very few. So you can't, we are not able to um, identify them to species to be able to environmentally or ecologically characterize them properly. Um, at this site, we also encountered uh, uh, human remains, um, a few specimens uh, in the entire profile, but we also found like uh, uh, intact burials. Uh, these burials are in interesting because one specific one that we opened nearly completely, we were able to see uh, uh, the kind of, uh, of person that they might have buried here. And uh, based on the, um, you know, uh, teeth um, modification, we're able to tell that it's uh, uh, remains of pastoralists, early pastoralists that lived here, I mean, uh, nilotic pastoralists that lived around here who do not live there right now. Right now, they're mostly prevalent in Northern Kenya. So it's interesting to find their remains here and it would be interesting in, in future to try and trace this with uh, you know, the events that um, accompanied uh, movement of domestication of animals uh, right from the north to the south of, of Kenya and probably back north. So we, we are going to be doing um, further studies of, of the skeletal remains that we managed to collect, probably do some um, DNA and isotope analysis to see uh, if you can retrace migrations and, and things like that. Another interesting thing was um, modification of bones. General modifications were, were, were noted, but this particular kind of modification is very interesting because we, we try to relate it with the, with the rock engravings that we see in Northern Kenya. These are associated with, um, with uh, age sets, uh, pastoralist age sets. And so in, many, in some places where you find uh, these, uh, you can actually relate it to the burial of a member of that age set. So uh, if we find uh, these uh, in, our, in our excavation, we couldn't directly associate it with any of the burials that we found. But it's interesting that we've, we, we found something like, that looks like this and we are trying to investigate if it's really related to uh, the rock art. The local community have no knowledge of anything that looks like this. So uh, it might be something that is much older and associated with the, with the burials. And then of course, these are also uh, common in uh, cattle marking, cattle branding by pastoralist communities and finding them amongst uh, rock arts is very interesting because it either means that they are coping from the rock art or the rock art is, is coping from them. So that's, that's interesting as well. Uh, we collected uh, sediment samples for phytolith and pollen analysis. And these um, basically show um, different um, you know, um, vegetation change dynamics in the area. We have a lot of uh, forest species uh, represented. I can't, I can't name them right now. But we also have um, grasses uh, from of moist and, and dry environments uh, represented. Interesting as um, uh, sage, sage, sage uh, uh, charcoal. And um, when we look around the site right now, we don't find uh, any 
any wetlands. So it's very interesting that they have this and we'd like to uh, survey somewhere and see if we can get a wetland from which we can uh, take calls and see uh, the relationship between uh, vegetation history in the area and then of course try to relate it with the, with the archaeological site. So um, in, in, in summary, um, we, we can now confirm that uh, the, the rock at the site is indeed uh, related with um, pastoralists and, uh, and hunter-gatherers, but we've added another component of farmers, so we're going to uh, have more people involved. Uh, dating work that is currently going is, try, is going to help us place uh, the different um, archaeological finds that we have in time and try to relate it with the uh, current art, I mean the rock art. We know that there's current methods of trying to date the uh, rock art immediately, uh, directly. So if, we are going to, if we can do that in future and try to place these things in time and tie them with the archaeological dates that we have, it's going to be uh, good. And then of course the uh, stone tools represent an earlier period. Uh, pottery represents all the cultural stages that we have at the site, so we know that all the people, all the cultural groups were there. And then, um, yeah, and then of course the pollen uh, tell us what the vegetation looks like, although uh, we still can't put it in temporal context yet. But uh, doing that will definitely be able to tell us about environmental change through, through this entire time. And so, yeah, basically uh, that's it. Uh, 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 future work will uh, enable us to place this site uh, you know, in the context of the environment and then of course be able to understand who exactly was uh, in this landscape at what time and you know, their impacts on the environment, uh, their cultural uh, practices and then of course uh, their general relationship with them, um, you know, their general, the part they played in uh, movement of, of uh, domestic animals or uh, I mean dispersal of the idea of uh, you know, domestication uh, in Eastern Africa. And that's, that's the end of my presentation. Do you think uh, there was a succession between first the hunter-gatherers, then the pastoralists, and then the farmers? Or could some of these uh, different cultures have been sharing the, the, this site, or is it? Do you think it's more succession or, or sharing? Um, at at this ex, at this site, uh, we think sharing uh, may not have been possible. But we can see a situation where a group moves out and another one comes in at a later date, and another one goes back. So, because right now, uh, if we look at say um, the lithic artifacts. We, some of them you can't tell uh, if they're coming from high up below or they all it's it's all mixed in between so there's a chance that people using stone tools uh, you know lived there throughout and it could either be you know pastoralists or herders all throughout yeah I think it's it's a mixture with maybe people going in and out of the site yeah but I think the dates will tell us better when 